come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. We have regaled you before, and it's quite possible we shall do so again with the unexpected exploits of Andrew Wolfe and Inspector James. The first, a gentlemanly scoundrel, and the latter, his nemesis. A bit like Javert, always on the trail of Jean Valjean, Les Miserables, you say. Not quite. For in the case of these two antagonists, seesawing on opposite sides of the law, each gives as good as he gets. Hello? Is this Andrew Wolfe? Who's this? Lila Beaufort. Lila? Yes, this is Andrew. What's the matter? Andrew, you have to help me. My husband's threatening me with a gun. Oh, please, as soon as you can. The downstairs door may be locked, too. Don't worry. I'll be there if I have to break all the doors down. Our mystery drama, The Case of the Forced Divorce, was adapted from an adventure of Arsène Lupin, especially for Mystery Theater by James Agate Jr., and stars Robert Dryden. I'll be back shortly with Act One. I suppose you could call them friendly enemies. Puppet Andrew Wolf and straight police inspector James. Wolf has the advantage, however. The inspector is based in Washington, D.C. Andrew is footloose and free to roam the world. He's turned over a new leaf, he says. Rather than being the victor to whom belong the spoils, now he spoils his victims, helping those who cannot turn to the law. And where do we find our friend Andrew as our curtain rises? In London, feeding the pigeons in Trafalgar Square. Is that you? Well, I've never seen you giving away anything in your life, even bird seed. <laughs> Aren't you feeling well? Inspector James, what are you doing in London? I was going to ask you the same thing. Uh, ten of us police inspectors took this charter holiday. Two weeks in England. All of Washington's top police brass over here? I should be in Washington. Very funny. You know, I can't believe it's really you up so early in the morning. I remember you as a night owl. That's new life. Besides, I don't sleep that well. So I come here mornings, feed the pigeons, and forget my troubles. You? Troubles? <laughs> What's the matter, a girl turn you down? Inspector James, your deductive powers don't fail you. Yes, that's exactly it. But I didn't have any right to fall in love with her. She was married. Ah, so you've given her up. Haven't seen her in a year. Hey, Inspector, the pubs and bars are closed this early, but let me take you for a cup of tea to welcome you to London town. A cup of tea at eight in the morning? Why not? It's an old English custom. Come on, we'll walk across the square. Andrew, tell me truthfully, this, uh, this lady who gave you the heave hole. Are you sure you weren't setting her up for a heist at some future time? Ooh, Inspector, what a suspicious man you are. <laughs> You've got me dead to rights. I'll confess. I was interested in a certain necklace belonging to the lady. That's how I wangled an invitation to a little party at her house. Then I learned everything she had was paste. Her husband had sold the family jewels, and she hardly has any money of her own. Oh, you used to pick your pigeons much better than that in Washington. You'll find, Inspector, here in England, titled people are often stone broke. Titled people? Mm. Dukes, earls, barons, even those of royal blood. Oh, this lost love of yours, Andrew, she wasn't by any chance a, a princess. <laughs> You flatter me, Inspector. No. But she is a countess. Goodbye, my darling boy. Have a good day in school and study hard. Bye, Billy. Bye, love. Lila? Good morning, George. 
I'll just send Billy off to school. He looks so cute. Yes, I saw him on the stairs. Lila, I want to have a serious talk with you. I told you last night, I told you last week, and last month there'll be no divorce. I know there's no love between us, but there's the boy to be considered, even if that's not important to you. So you can stop begging me for a divorce. I've stopped begging, Lila. That's sensible. Um, come to the window. Would you look down into the street? Whatever for? Have a look. Well, there's nothing in the streets of... No, 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 no. Just wait a moment. Oh, there's little Billy. Oh, look at him marching along, swinging his books. Isn't he a lamb? Keep watching him, Lila. He's walking to the corner. Now he's waiting for the traffic light to change. Oh, there's a good boy. A car is stopping next to him. Isn't that... Well, that's your office car, George. Isn't that Mr. Pfeffer, your secretary? Oh. Oh, he's pulling Billy into the car. What's he doing? The car's driving off. What's happening, George? Do you think Pfeffer is just giving Billy a lift to school? He forced Billy into the car. George, what have you done? Now, perhaps you'll look most sensibly on my request for a divorce. I'm having Billy taken to my mother's. You've had Billy kidnapped. He's your own son. How can you do that? Let's say he'll be away for an extended visit with my mother. Is there anything wrong with that? Are you crazy? Billy won't stay at your mother's. He'll just get on a bus and come home. I don't think so. A mother is taking him to the country with her. Where? No place I've rented. You don't think I'd tell you. I'll, I'll get a lawyer. You can't get away with this. You're mad. You may need a lawyer. What's that you're taking out of your pocket? Oh, just some very strong bandages, my dear. Oh. Unless you want to get the beating of your life, you will do exactly as you're told. Oh, don't! You're hurting me! I need to know where you are and what you're up to for the next 24 hours. That's why I'm oh. tying you up and why I shall lock you in. And let me warn you, you can scream, but all your cause is a scandal. So I advise you to keep quiet until I return. There. Feel that tight enough? Oh, um, do you see this revolver? Oh, no. Yes, I agree with you. I'd rather keep it in my pocket than use it. I'll be back in a few hours. you up. George did. The Earl, your husband? Yes, yeah, sit still. I'll untie your wrist. Oh. <laughs> Look at this room. Chairs overturned, books on the floor. That was me, Andrew. You remember you gave me your card and said if I ever needed help, I'd put it in one of the books up there. I had a hard time getting it down. Everything fell. I fell. Then I had to push the phone off the hook. 
And the push buttons? I took a pencil in my mouth and pressed each one in turn. Oh, if you are something. There. Now you're on time. Oh, I don't know what I would have done if you hadn't answered the phone. You feel all right? <laughs> Want some water? Brandy? No, I'm fine. First of all, where is he? The Earl, your husband. George is either at his office or his mother's. He said he'd be back in a few hours. George wants to divorce me and marry someone else. But he also wants custody of little Billy. Whatever for? Not because he cares about our son. But Billy will inherit a great deal of money from his grandfather. And George wants control of it. What are you afraid of, Countess? Let him take you to court. The man's barbaric. I'll tell you what. Do you see this ring on my finger? My wedding ring? I used to look at it often when we were last together. That's not the ring I had last year. I lost that ring somehow. It fell behind something. I could never find it. I was afraid George would be upset. So I had another ring made, just like it, by the same jeweler. Only I did a stupid, stupid thing. There was once a man in my life who meant everything to me. Instead of having the date of my wedding to George inscribed as we had before, I had something else written there. The name of the man I truly loved and could never marry. Does George know? I'm not sure. He's asked me a few times to take this ring off just for him to see. I couldn't do it. Not because I wouldn't, but because my knuckle has grown so I can't. And is this what he's threatening you with? What right has he to be jealous? He wants to marry another woman. And he wants Billy's money. So he'll do anything to prove I'm an unfit mother. What's written in the ring is only the beginning. This morning the worst happened. He had his secretary kidnap Billy right off the street on his way to school. I saw it happening. Oh, that man is mad. Uh, you said right now he's at his office or his mother's. He was going to have Billy taken to her after school, and they were going off somewhere to the country. Well, surely Mrs. Beaufort would listen to reason if you explained this to her. She's never liked me. George has filled her ears with all kinds of lies about me. Uh, George, is he still in the book business? World distributors, wasn't it? Yes, on Friar Street in the city. What are you going to do? Pay him a visit. Oh, but he'll know you, Andrew. The dance of the ambassadors and the party in this house a year ago, remember? George has a very good memory. No, I'll go see him as someone else. A lot of your face can be hidden behind a walrus mustache. Andrew, I don't know what you're planning, but be careful. George carries a gun. I follow my instincts. Don't worry, Countess. You won't know me. I'm going to do my best to free you from this intolerable situation. What do I do when he comes back? I'll tie you up again so he won't know anyone's been here. Oh. I'll have to lock the door from the outside, too. Oh, and the telephone receiver. Back on the hook, that goes. I may just want to call you. You've tied my hands again. How can I answer? What did you do before? When you called me. How did you get the phone off the hook? Very, very carefully. With my nose. Andrew Wolfe, master of masquerade and stealth, who claims he has retired from flaunting the law, is now about to take the law into his own hands. How this reckless daring and uncatchable outlaw succeeds, we shall hear for ourselves when I return shortly with Act Two. Discover the Dermasoft formula for hard, callous skin. Apply Dermasoft cream to feet, hands, and elbows as directed. Dermasoft gives you the same callus-removing ingredient that doctors use most. Now you can soften and remove hard, callous skin without painful cutting or scraping. Dermasoft cream. A 
quick reminder to help set the scene for Act Two. The Earl of Hastings, George Beaufort, is trying to force his wife, the Countess, to give him a divorce and secure the custody of their 10-year-old son, Billy. The boy will inherit a fortune when he comes of age. So far, however, George Beaufort is all threats, preying on his wife's fear of scandal. Her friend, Andrew Wolf, a retired arch swindler, is about to demonstrate that an amateur cheat is no match for a professional. Inspector James! Uh, hello, Andrew. Are you following me? Words of one syllable, yes. Haven't you anything better to do? I thought you came to see the sights of London. Andrew, I'll tell you a little secret. Whenever I see you, wherever it is, I know that something's going on that shouldn't be. So I'm curious. Uh, Inspector, where are you staying? Uh, the police boys and I are at the Hempstead Hotel. I may need your help later on. There may be trouble. Oh, no. I'm a visiting lawman. I have no jurisdiction here. If you need official help, why don't you ask Scotland Yard? Because I may need unofficial help. I'm in kind of a rush now, if you don't mind. See that red glass door? I'm going in there. Well, I've seen those all over London. The street telephone booths, aren't they? Well, the English call them telephone boxes. Right now, I call them mighty useful. Is this five, 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 double seven, oh, nine? Yes, it is. George Beaufort? Yes, speaking. This is the GPO. We've had a report your telephone is out of order. Will there be someone there to let repair service in? I haven't noticed the telephone out of order. Well, that's our report, sir. Will there be someone there? Will you send the man up directly? Yes, I'll be here for another hour. Oh, thank you. We'll tend to it right away. Finished? Didn't take you very long to make those repairs. Why, your telephone mainly required a new uh, uh, rectifier, and uh, we rectified it. Indeed. Do you have another problem? Merely report it to GPO and they'll send another man over. As a matter of fact, we didn't have any trouble in the first place. Well, I don't know about that. I was instructed to come and have a look, which I did. Oh, by the way, I was going to compliment you on that automobile you have parked on Fry Street in front of your door. It is yours, isn't it? Uh, yes, it is. Now, if you don't mind... Beautifully styled, if I do say so. Uh, thank you. Now, I have to get back to work. Ha, 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 we all, sir. Well, thank you kindly. Have a good day, Governor. Oh, uh, yes, sir. What can I do for you, sir? I see by your sign you rent cars by the day or week. <laughs> what type of car did you have in mind, sir? Do you have any small jobs? Oh, yes, we can let you have a mini by the day. Ah, that'll suit me fine. If you'll just have, have a seat, sir. Thank you. And I'll uh, fill out the usual form. Your name? James. J-A-M-E-S. Inspector Harold James. Inspector? Oh. Are you with the yard, sir? No, 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 I'm a visitor. I'm with the Washington police. That's Washington, D.C., America. Here's my ID card, my badge. Uh, I must say, Andrew, you're a man of many surprises. Pick me up in a car and take me for a spin in the country, hmm? It's darn nice of you. Uh, Inspector, regardless of our opinions in the past, I want to show England to you. Hold on, we're making a sharp turn here. <laughs> These English roads. <laughs> I shouldn't think they're wide enough for cars to pass each other. They are. Uh, as I was saying, I enjoy showing England to everyone I meet. Uh, friend or enemy? Oh, I wouldn't call you either, Inspector. 
The man responsible for putting me behind bars as many times as you is hardly a friend, but I don't think of you as an enemy, really. I was on one side of the law. You were on the other. Well, I'm delighted you've reformed, Andrew. I'd say, Inspector, I consider you more of a business associate than a partner. We were always in the same line. You tried to protect the rich. And you tried to rob them. <laughs> Division of labor. Hold on now. Another sharp turn. <laughs> you know, Andrew, if I didn't think otherwise, I'd say you were, uh, you were following that car up ahead. Oh, you would? Well, we're miles from anywhere. He makes the right turn at a crossroad, so do you. And he turns left, you do too. The, the both of you, same speed. That fellow is taking his family for an outing, and we just happen to be going in the same direction. Uh, another turn here. There. <laughs> Are you all right, Inspector? Yeah. Thanks for that safety belt. That was a nasty bump. Better back my car up and get onto the shoulder. I, I'm sorry. It was a blind corner. How did I know he was going to stop short at his house? When I came around that corner, there he was. Lucky for him, his passengers were out of the car. Passengers? Well, didn't you see them? Elderly woman and little boy. Oh, there, going into the house. I'm afraid we're in for some trouble. Inspector, remember I said I might need a little unofficial assistance? Let me borrow your driving license. Well, what for? It's a D.C. license. American. You can't use it here. I don't have mine with me, and it might become sticky driving without some kind of license. Okay? Well, I know I'm going to regret this. But if you hadn't been driving me around, I don't suppose this would have happened. Uh, I reckon I owe it to you here. I don't lose it. Thanks, friend of my youth. Hello. Yes. Uh, much damage? I've just been taking a look. Uh, the back bumper's a bit dented. Fog light smashed. Uh, I'm not sure. There may be damage to the boot, too. I'm sorry about this, but I didn't have time to stop. Your house is awfully close to the corner. I guess we'd better exchange licenses. Yes. Uh, here's mine. Um, George Pelfort. Here's mine. Harold James. Inspector James. My ID card and badge. Washington, D.C. Oh. Well, look, I, I, I don't... Well, what I mean is there's not that much damage to my car and you're a visitor, so... Uh, well, why don't we forget it? Huh? Oh, that's very kind of you, but what about your passengers? How are they? Were your son and your wife hurt? Uh, that's my mother. Billy is my son. They were out of the car before you hit me. Uh, I feel badly about this. Uh, let me take a look around your car. There may be more damage than you think. No, no, really, Inspector. There's really no damage to speak of. all that about? I saw you exchanging licenses, and he's shaking his head, and you're shaking your head, and then you start walking around his car, examining it. Interesting how the guilty mind reveals itself. Oh, oh, oh. you ought to know, Andrew. I examined his car, see? The boot was severely dented, the bonnet got pushed against a tree, the right wing looked like it had been attacked by a spanner, but the man said, forget it. Why? Now, hold on now. Boot, bonnet, wing, spanner? Would you mind saying that in English? It is English, you ignorant flatfoot. Boot is trunk, bonnet is hood. A spanner is a wrench, and a wing is a fender. Oh, what a country. You need a dictionary to speak English over here. Uh, it's very interesting about that George Beaufort. He thought I was you, and he didn't want to be involved with a policeman. Mm, maybe it was you he was steering clear of, Andrew. You kind of driving like a maniac down those narrow lanes. That, too. Oh, what do you mean? 
You guessed it, Inspector. I was following him. What? What for? By tomorrow, I'll pick you up at your hotel and I'll let you in on the whole story. Yeah, thanks for the loan of the license. Yeah, probably illegal letting you pass for me. Well, it's always the first time, Inspector, of all in a good cause. Uh, do you remember my telling you about the woman in my life, the beautiful married one, whom I said goodbye to a year ago? Ooh, and they say the wicked aren't romantic. That man we ran into, he's her husband. I'm sorry I'm later than I thought I'd be, Lila, dear, but a stupid American police officer ran into me. Well, nothing to say, Lila. Had time to think over my proposition. Where is Billy? What have you done with him? He was taken to school. I picked him up after lunch, and right now he's in the country with Mother. You're absolutely mad. People don't behave this way, tying me up, kidnapping the child. What do you expect to gain? A divorce and custody. Where is Billy? I told you he's safe with Mother. And for how long am I going to be kept a prisoner in my own house? Did you see this agreement? Well, when you sign it. That I'll never. Perhaps you need a little persuading. Don't be ridiculous. Put that gun away. An accident, that's all. It went off. Makes a big hole in that lovely white leg of yours. George, stop that. Are you sure you won't sign? Certainly not, until I have a lawyer. All right. Of course, you might not wish anyone present when we have your wedding ring removed. You keep talking about the ring. It's the one we were married with. Is it? Why should I lie to you? Precisely what I want to find out. I can't get it off my hand. Yes, that's why the jeweler is coming tomorrow morning. Snip, snip, and then we shall see. George, be reasonable. I'll never sign anything that will separate me from Billy. Never. Let me show you something that may change your mind. Have a look at this. Do you recognize it? A ring? Not an ordinary ring, but the ring, the original. I found it in the house where you'd hidden it. Don't ask me why, although I can guess. Now, do you see? Inside, it's engraved with the date of our marriage. That's all. So the one you're wearing... What ring is that, Lila? <laughs> Don't tell me. I love surprises. And when old Conroy comes with his jeweler's tools, we'll find out. Of course, before morning, you may decide against that. Excuse me, my dear. Hello? Is this the Beaufort residence? Yes, it is. The Earl of Hastings? Yes. May I speak to Mr. Beaufort? This is the telephone repair service of the GBO. Ah, speaking. Just checking, Mr. Beaufort. Did our man come round to your office to check out your telephone? Uh, yes, he did. Thank you very much. Am I going to remain in this room tied up all night with no dinner, no place to sleep? I'd like to go to my bedroom. You'll stay right here. I'll go out and fetch some food. I won't run away. Why don't you untie my hands? Oh, all right. Hold still and I'll cut your hands loose. Hello? Countess? That was you, wasn't it, a few minutes ago? Your husband's not in the room. He just went out to get some food. I hadn't expected he'd be picking up the phone. Andrew, I think he's gone mad. He waved that pistol and threatened me. He's out of his head. I've located your son. Billy, you have? How? Is he all right? I'll tell you when I see you. I have a feeling about your husband and I want to get inside your house tonight. You think he might be dangerous? I don't want to take that chance. Any ideas? Andrew, could you pretend to be my lawyer? Your lawyer? Yes. Of course I could. I'll be there in an hour. What's your name? Um, Harmsworth Blackburn. There's 
Andrew Wolf any more disguises left in his makeup kit? Let's see. So far, he has impersonated a retired businessman, a telephone repairman, and a Washington inspector of police. But the most successful of his deceits is that Lila Beaufort, Countess of Hastings, has no idea that her friend and rescuer, Andrew Wolf, is a much-wanted renegade himself. Check with me shortly for Act Three. It's Athletes versus MS. We're at Lime Rock Auto Track in Connecticut. Meet Ron Gagne. I used to race cars, but it takes a lot of coordination and quick response. I had it until MS, multiple sclerosis, attacked my central nervous system. With Ron Gagne, Paul Newman, actor and fellow race driver, and his racing teammate, Terry Knight. My teammate, Terry, and I race against the clock, just like Ron here. We want to beat multiple sclerosis before it beats him. You see, multiple sclerosis doesn't just cripple. So we all have to find a cure before it's too late. Help us get Ron back on the road to good health. Send a check to the MS Society. When you help, we all win. This message has been brought to you by the National Multiple Sclerosis Society, 205 East 42nd Street, New York City, 10017. such and such an hour, the boom will be lowered. The execution will take place. The shot will be fired. So it is in this case of the forced divorce. It is nine o'clock in the evening. In exactly 12 hours, a jeweler is expected to arrive at 21 Eaton News to remove a ring from a finger, unmasking a deception, and placing the countess in a dilemma. Sir? Um, I see you looking at these house numbers. Can I help you? Uh, thank you, sir. You can. I'm looking for the residence of the Countess of Hastings. I seem to have mislaid the address. Well, you are fortunate. I happen to be returning home. I am the Earl of Hastings, George Beaufort. Ah, Mr. Beaufort, indeed. I'm Harmsworth Blackburn, solicitor. I'm afraid I don't have my card. The countess called my office on a matter of some urgency, she said, and I was at home and came directly after dinner. I think I heard Big Ben striking nine just now. Yes, I believe my wife has been expecting you. If you'll be so good, Mr. Blackburn, I'll just unlock the front door. The countess is well, is she? My office said she sounded, uh... Shall we say, the third? Uh, do step inside. Yes, I would say under the circumstances, my wife is well enough. These matters, when solicitors become involved, are never very happy. Are you also represented by counsel, Mr. Belfort? And uh, if so, is he here? No, I shan't be needing a lawyer. This is a matter of a simple agreement between two parties, and that's all. Well, then. Shall we go out and join the Countess? Countess, I think you've explained the case very well. You wish your son returned. Your husband desires a settlement to be followed by a divorce. Mr. Blackburn, he also wants custody of my son when the divorce becomes final. Ah, uh, Mr. Beaufort, might I ask why you desire custody? Surely a mother is better fitted to take care of a young child than his father. I don't happen to believe my wife a fit person to be entrusted with my son's upbringing. Oh, indeed. 
And you have evidence to support such a belief? And by tomorrow morning, I think I'll have it. But frankly, I don't think my wife would like to defend this case in court. The publicity... Are we talking about a certain alleged inscription in her wedding ring? What right does my husband have to see it? Every right in the world. You're my wife. He doesn't believe it's the ring we were married in. He has some idea... It's a mad idea that it's a symbol of love between myself and some other man. Well, we shall see, shan't we? Countess, my advice is have the ring cut from your finger tomorrow morning. What? It will prove that your husband's accusations are without foundation. Mr. Blackburn, I'd like to talk with you in private. Ah, Mr. Belfort, if you don't mind. Of course. I'll be downstairs if you need me. I don't know what to do. I really don't. Shh, 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 shh. Let's make sure he's going downstairs. Yes, he's out of earshot. Andrew, you did marvelously. But why did you side with him? There is a name inside my wedding band. I told you that. What's the name of the jeweler coming here in the morning? Conroy. His store is just down the street, Ebury Street. He lives over the store. Good. Do you mean I should go ahead with it? Face it? I do, absolutely. Countess, trust me. Mr. Blackburn, you're here very early, and the jeweler isn't expected for another hour. Do come in. Thank you. I'm afraid, Mr. Beaufort, I shan't be able to witness the event. I'm due in court. It completely slipped my mind. Oh, I am sorry. But in any case, the ring itself will be evidence enough. Uh, Mr. Beaufort, I understand that when you've obtained the divorce... You plan to marry another party? Marry? Me? Whatever gave you such an idea? Well, if I may take a further moment of your time, I have with me one of those little pocket tape recorders, and I'd like to play for you a recording of a telephone conversation which was clocked at half past eight last night. It emanated from the exchange on Fire Street, and the number dialed was in Bromley. Now, I'll switch it on. interesting conversation, Mr. Belfort. Where did you get that? Do tell the Countess I'm sorry I can't be here when the jeweler arrives, but I shall be in touch. No, no. No need to see me through the door, Mr. Belfort. Good morning. I'm curious. Has the jeweler arrived yet? Conroy just called. He's ill. Sudden indisposition. He's sending over an assistant. Oh, delays, delays. Why are you so angry, George? I'm giving in to you so you can see for yourself what's written in the ring? I know what's engraved. Conroy told me he engraved it. If you know, why are you going through all this? He said it was a name, but he couldn't remember what. Ah, there's the jeweler. I'll go and let him in. This is Mr. Conroy's assistant, Lila, Mr. Parfrey. He's ready to cut the ring. Oh, that scruffy fat thing. Look at 
his nails, his face, like a chimney sweep. Yes, darling, well, I'm sure he knows what to do. Uh, Mr. Conroy told you what we want done, uh, didn't he? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah, the rain's grown too tight. I'm to cut it. Nothing to it. Twist of the pincers and that shirt. <laughs> give me your hand, madam. Lila, give Mr. Parfrey your hand. I can't. Why don't we wait till Mr. Conroy can come? Lila, I'll hold your hand steady. Yeah, all right, uh, you can cut the ring off now and be careful not to hurt my wife's hand. Uh, there we are. Uh, would you bend the two halves back, Mr. Parfrey, and hand it to me? Uh, no, no, better yet. Hand the ring to my wife. Thank you. Oh, uh, where you been hating me anymore? No, thank you. Um, I'd show you out myself, but I'd rather stay here for the moment. Uh, thank Mr. Conroy for me, will you? Oh, that's all right, sir. Hey, I can find my way. Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, madam. All right, darling. Now, what is engraved inside the ring? I don't wish to read it. All right, then. Give it to me, and I'll read it. What? What's this? Aren't you going to read what it says? I... I don't understand. There's a date inscribed there. It's the date of our wedding. You've done something, Lila. You pulled some kind of trick on me. I'm sorry you did that, Lila. It would have been much easier for everyone all around if you hadn't forced my hand. George, I wish you'd calm down. There's nothing to get excited about. Please. Put that gun back in your pocket. Oh, well, there's no one here. No one in the house. I'll say it was an accident. I was showing you the gun and it went off before I could do anything. George, don't! Are you all right? Uh, uh, Mr. Palfrey? No, no, it's me, Andrew, in this awful get-up. Andrew! Let's have a look at George. I didn't even hit him when I fired from the door. Just singed his wrist. He's fainted dead away. Oh, by the way, Countess, let me introduce you to an old friend of mine. A friend of my youth. <laughs> he saw the whole thing. How do you do? Inspector Harold James. He's from America, Washington, D.C. Pleased to meet you, Countess. I asked him to come along. He was standing outside the door the whole time. I thought we might need a witness. Uh, that was a narrow escape. This uh, gentleman on the floor, your husband? Yes, he is. That's quite a weapon he had pointed at you. He wasn't himself. He really wasn't, Inspector. Oh, Andrew, I was afraid I'd never see you again. You didn't leave me alone after all. I knew that when George realized he'd made a mistake about the ring, he might turn nasty. But the ring? How did you... Oh, I shouldn't ask. Any man who can be so many men must have his reasons. What's going to happen to me now, Andrew? I don't think you have anything to worry about now, Countess. Attempted murder in any country carries with it quite a stiff sentence. Right, Inspector? How did you like Westminster Abbey, Inspector? Well, it's a gloomy old place, Andrew, but very beautiful. I really appreciated the guarded tour, but... Uh... Remember, you did promise me an explanation. There's nothing much to tell, really. Oh, the ring business and the husband who was so dead sure it had another man's name in it. Do you know this sleight of hand trick, Inspector? I take one coin in my hand. You see it? What is it? Oh, a small brown coin. Right. That's one penny English. Now you see it? Now you don't. What's in my hand? Huh. Nothing. Correct. But look again. What's in my hand now? Oh, a larger silver coin. Ten pence. 
And that is how the ring I cut from the counter's finger was replaced with the one I had inscribed for the occasion. You cut from her finger? Oh, yes. I thought my poor finger, Julie's assistant. <laughs> Goodbye, sir. Goodbye, madam. So the countess wasn't as innocent as all that, huh? But uh, did you know whose name was in her ring? She told me it was a man she'd loved and who had died. But she wasn't telling the truth. She didn't love him. No. He's still alive. That was her.